Most wars are fought over the possession of land. From the southeastern corner of the Asian continent extends a peninsula which contains six countries. This area of the world, long known as Indochina, has seen the devastation of war since man first discovered that the land was rich and productive. In this decade, Vietnam is the country which is in the mind of most people. And it is the country of Vietnam and our experience in the Vietnam War that we're focusing on today. Hi everybody, I'm Tim Gore and I'm very happy to welcome you to Marquette High School for today's program where we're being joined on site by students of the Air Force Junior ROTC program here at Marquette and as always by students connecting to us across the country via video conference, internet, or television. That Department of Defense video gives you a little bit of background information from the early 1960s. It was designed to familiarize Americans with the nation of Vietnam since we were beginning to get involved in that struggle. Most Americans had no idea Vietnam was even a place on the map, but of course as the decade of the 1960s continued and we began the 1970s, Vietnam would be a predominant force in American media coverage and in Americans' lives. Two individuals who joined us today spent time in that war, and I'm happy to introduce them to you now. Let's begin by introducing Colonel Jack Jackson. Colonel Jackson, thanks Thank for being you. with us. Pleasure to be here. So it's the early 1960s, the time period of that documentary, 63, 64. What are you doing then? In 1963, 64, I was a uh, junior in college at Purdue University studying engineering. And only association I even had with Vietnam was what I saw on television and some of my friends who are in ROTC were preparing to go that way. And that was about the extent of my association at that point in my life with Vietnam. But as you'll learn as we go through the program, his association with Vietnam would change in the course of the next few years. We're also being joined by Commander Tom Mundell. Commander Mundell, thanks so much for being with us. Early 1960s, was Vietnam a place on the map you were familiar with? What were you doing? I was in school, and um, I just happened to see a commercial on television that uh, inspired me to be a man and um, wear a Green Beret and fly helicopters. And at the time, I w had made some um, kind of challenging um, decisions in my life, and I had already had a child, and um, I had to become a man real quick. And I wanted to do that, and I felt going in the military might uh, give my family, uh, my wife and my daughter, uh, Angel, a, um, a little boost in life. And um, it was a boost, okay. Well, we're very glad to have you with us today. We're going to begin our conversation with some student questions right here from our friends at Marquette High School, the Junior ROTC program. I'm going to ask Maggie to come up to the microphone. We'll begin with her question as we start to talk, gentlemen, about what got you involved in the military, and then we'll actually hear Mary's question as well, and Sam's. They all deal with that decision to go into the military, and then we'll begin to talk about that a little bit. Maggie, go right ahead. Were you drafted, or did you choose to join the military? So that's question one about being drafted or choosing. Mary, join us, and we can also add this to the mix. What age did you join the military? for your ages, and then Sam. Why did you join the military? So why? Big questions now in terms of time frame, in terms of age, and why you chose to join. Jack, let's start with you. When is it that you decide to join? You're in the middle of college career, my goodness. You're a boilermaker yes. in Purdue. Uh, I think Maggie's question was, um, was uh, I drafted it or did I uh, enlist? I had a draft deferment after college. I graduated from college. And I was working for General Motors, and I had a draft deferment. They called it a critical skill deferment because of my degree. And I uh, chose to wait. I, I didn't like building cars. I was working for General Motors. I didn't like it. So I was driving home one time, and I saw a poster that said, be a Marine. I thought, that is a good-looking uniform. Gave it a lot of thought, right? And so I went home and I uh, went in the next day. I waived my draft deferment. I told my boss, I, here's my two-week notice. I'm going to join the Marine Corps. And he said, would you like to fly airplanes? I said, I would prefer not to be in the Air Force. I want to be a Marine. I like that uniform. He said, come here, you knucklehead. I'm going to explain to you how the Marines are trained to fly. And Mary, your question was? Your age at the my time. My age. I was 23 going on 24, and Sam... Why did you join the military? Why? Um, I thought I, I wanted to be a Marine. I, I looked at, at 
what they stood for and what people in the military stood for and the men and women I respected who put the uniform on, as you will. And I, that, was, that was the big reason that I decided to do it. So Tom, Jack has graduated from college and is already out in the workforce. You're younger when you decide to I'm join. I'm just a kid. <laughs> so you're 17? I was 18. 18. 18. Okay, so give the students an idea about why did you chose to join and why did you pick the branch of service you did? Well, I had kind of um, brought a lot of things into my own life uh, due to my own decision making and had a child and uh, felt a responsibility toward that. And um, I was 18 and um, I felt it was the right thing to do at the time and I stepped up and did what I felt I needed to do f for both of them as well as myself to guarantee a future. Were you involved in being a gunner? Did you always? I was in flight school. Uh -huh. I had joined to actually become an aviator and we, it was a crash there and, and uh, I had to wait for a recycle and it was about six months to go for a recycle to get back into flight school and uh, my cousin was already in Vietnam and he said why don't you come over here and fly with me and so that's what I did. I, I asked the base commander if I could go to Vietnam and, and come back and go to flight school and he said sure and they let me go and um, um, that was the beginning of my aviation career and I learned a lot and they need skids to land too believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is helpful. We've got some great video of uh, gunner training and I think it'd be nice if we could show this gunner training video while you describe to the students what was your training experience like? What would, did you go through a boot camp? Was it straight to like oh, for, training uh, for, for, uh, for the, the as, gunner as a work? Gunner? Yeah, no. as a gunner. It was first day in Vietnam. My cousin picked me up at Tonsonut Air Base in a helicopter just about like that right there. And it was just him and I. And he showed me what an M60 machine gun was. And he goes, I'm gonna show you how to shoot this. We'll go out and shoot it a couple times and um, give you an idea of what it's like to really be in a real aircraft in Vietnam. I said, okay. We were out there 15 minutes and uh, flew beside the Pelican Island. And next thing I knew, we were shot down and I was in the river. And um, I, I was lucky enough to get out and somehow I did never let go of my weapon. And uh, my cousin pulled me out and we got onto shore and uh, uh, all of a sudden a bunch of black pajamas came running at me. And um, Let the students know what black pajamas refers those to. Those were Viet Cong. Uh, the North Vietnamese Army had uniforms and the VC, Viet Cong, had uh, black pajamas that they wore. Um, and they um, were firing at us. And to be truthfully, uh, perfectly honest, I was scared to death. I didn't know what was going on because it was all of a sudden a lot of noise and things. And I was backing up and I fell over driftwood. And when I did, I pulled the trigger. And when I did on the M60, it had a long belt of ammunition still attached to it somehow. I don't know why. But it scraped across right where it was supposed to go. And I fell down on the ground. Next thing I know, I, uh, I've got a general standing in front of me telling me I did some m magnificent shooting. and. I had six kills there and it was all by accident, but that was my beginning of my career, my very first day in Vietnam. And I wanted to be an aviator and I wanted to be a gunner. Was yours on the job training as well or did you do flight school? Or? I did flight school. I went through the, um, the Naval flight training uh, and the Navy trains Marines and obviously they're Naval aviators. Uh, we went through in 11 months. Uh, it's now 26 months to give you an example of the training. I made my first carrier landing aboard the USS Roosevelt on a Sunday. 11 months later, I got my wings. Two months after that, I went to my tactical squadron. Two months after that, I was in Vietnam, flying combat missions. So, uh, and I went over as a jet pilot. But you also flew helicopters and as well. And they stuck me in helicopters. I got over, I said, we really need helicopter pilots. Guys like Tom want to be gunners, so we need pilots. <laughs> we've, got, we've got video actually of arming the helicopter, and while we look at this, Jack, give the students some idea. What kinds of weapons did you have available? Rockets, missiles, what were available to you on the helicopter? On the helicopter. Um, we had uh, M60 M machine guns. They shot 7.62 rounds, and we had uh, 2.75 inch rockets, meaning they're about a round as a, a baseball bat, a little smaller, and about that long. We had two rocket pods that way, and then the door gunners had the machine guns. And uh, a little known fact, what's said here stays here all over the world. Um, when one guy was flying, as an example, if Tim and I were, or Tom and I were flying, if he's flying the helicopter, I would shoot out the window. 
and vice versa. So you'd have an M16, and, and uh, we, we would do a lot of shooting. You can see them loading. And we had outposts. We took that helicopter at 6 in the morning or 6 at night, and when you needed ammunition, you would go to this location and reload, rearm, get fuel, and uh, start all over. You kept it all day, 12-hour days. Well, we're going to spend a good deal of time letting you all get a sense of what it was like to be in combat during the Vietnam War. And to begin with, we're going to look at some video of the topography of the country so you get a sense of what it is they're looking down into as they're flying over it and what the enemy positions would be like and how they would be shrouded. So you're dealing with a, you're dealing with a country that does have a lot of hills, mountainous terrain as well. It's not the same kind of country we were dealing with in World War II. Tank warfare wasn't nearly going to be what it was uh, in World War II. You needed to fly in a lot of ways. There was a great deal of jungle. And obviously you also had to deal with water and marshlands, all of that together. And Tom, how easy was it as you guys are flying above? Are you flying pretty close to the canopy of the trees? We, uh, in loaches, we were on top. And a loach is what? That's a low observation attack helicopter. Um, we had many guns in, on ours also, plus our free 60 M60s. But we, we hovered right on top of the triple canopy. That's uh, f um, f foliage that has undergrowth three different levels of undergrowth underneath it. And you, you learn, you train yourself to be able to see through that the best that you can, but a lot of times you don't see through it, and a lot of things, terrible things happen because of that. And Jack, are you able to see their gun positions? Were you aware that gun positions were there? Was it all based on the fact of where the fire was coming from? Uh, many times in the triple canopy, you could not actually see the enemy guns. And we would try and draw their fire. And once we drew their fire, uh, we would uh, then take that position on and, and eliminate it. The issue sometimes was though, they, our enemy, don't, and, for, and God forbid any of you have to go to war, but if you do, I'll be very proud and you will do this country proud, all of you. But there, don't ever underestimate the intelligence of your enemy. They were smart, they knew what they were doing, and many times, they would, it would be a decoy it really wouldn't be a gun at all. And there'd be somebody down there just shooting, say, a flare in the air, and as you roll in on it, they would shoot from the sides. And uh, that'd ruin your whole day. And there were, there were tunnels that yes. they had successfully built. We've got and, a, and, a tunnel uh, entrance. I didn't realize up. just how the tunnel network was effective. I had two situations. Uh, my first one was, for those of you who aren't familiar, I, a napalm bomb is like a fire bomb. And you may have seen movies of it or pictures of it. And I was dropping a napalm one day, and it was close to our troops. And, and uh, it happened to just go down one of the openings to the tunnel. And I'm telling you, there were, when that thing exploded down in that tunnel, there was smoke coming for an uh, area the size of your school that came up different places. The second uh, time that I had a really close encounter with a, with a spider hole, as we called them, there was a, a very severe firefight. The medevac helicopter had landed, and they were getting shot up pretty bad, so I was in a helicopter, and I went down, I hovered in front of them, and I was just shooting, and, when I, and they were, were loading the wounded on the other helicopter. And when, all of a sudden, about 30 yards in front of me, out of a spider hole, jumped two uh, regular NVA, and they had what we would term a 50 caliber machine gun. It shoots a bullet about as long as your dinner knife and about as big around as a hot dog. And I can still to this day see that man pulling that bolt back to put a round in the chamber, and it jammed. He couldn't get the bolt home, and I often thought, if that bolt would have went home, he'd have just blown that helicopter. I was flying to pieces. He couldn't get it home. And I remember shooting, and then there was nothing, and uh, we, we came out of there. Those are my two memorable experiences with tunnels. 
and that sort of thing. And as you're describing that story, you talked about evacuating uh, the wounded with helicopters. We've got some video we can bring up, because Tom, as a person who was on those helicopters, as, as well as Colonel Jackson, talk a little bit about the nature of picking up the wounded, going down to the ground. Were you constantly dealing with enemy fire as you, as you had to land, and what this process was like to pick up the wounded? Actually, Jack can answer that more better okay. than I can, because I was I was one being picked up normally. I, I didn't go down and pick anybody else up. They were picking me up. You know, when we came in after <clears throat> people like Tom and the severely wounded, normally in a gunship, we would provide cover. But when the combat situation was so severe, yeah. the what we call slicks, and what a slick is, it's the same helicopter, but it's not armed. And the reason they didn't arm it is you can, if you don't have that ordinance on there, you can get one more wounded person out of there. And when you're talking about bringing out four versus three, and you're that fourth person. So that's why they were slicks, like, you, like you're watching now. When it was so bad and the shooting was so bad, we would send the gunships in. And that was my job. We would shoot our way in. We would take out the most severely wounded first. Uh, there was a guy who uh, we pulled out. It was a very severe firefight. And as I met him, this is 30 years ago. I, I met this guy, and he said, you're Lieutenant Jackson. And I said, oh, well, I used to be. <laughs> this, this gentleman was in St. Charles. And he said, you saved my life. And I said, how do you know this? And he said, when you landed, they threw me on the helicopter. And I was sitting in this seat, and they threw him on, on this side. We wore our name tags above our, on our wings up here, above our, our, uh, on our, on our flight suits. And he said, as I turned to reach to grab his ammo belt and pull him in, he looked up and saw my name tag. And he said, you said this to me, and I don't recall it. I slapped an old oily rag. He'd been shot through the side. And I slapped that rag on there and told him to put his arm on, on that and roll over as we left, or he was going to bleed out. And um, years later, and just I said, how do you know? And he picked up his shirt, and he goes, that's where I was shot. Hmm. And that was the type of things we did with the gunships, to go in and get the guys. Or if they were being overrun, you know, traditionally a a unit of 12 guys would think they would take on a battalion, which is 800 bad guys, or enemies, they weren't bad guys. And we'd have to go in and get them, and it was always interesting. And one thing that was interesting, in the triple canopy, they would have the decoys, but when we go, somebody like that, we had smoke canisters, about the size of a can of pork and beans. And we learned real quick, I told you the, the, the enemy was intelligent. We had to say, Papa Smoke. They were different colors, you have orange, green, yellow, whatever, oh, wow. red. And we, if the ground guy said, I'm popping a green smoke, you didn't go there, because that was a bad guy. What you said was, Papa Smoke. And they would pop it, and then we would tell them the color. Mm. That's green. That's us. Because you'd see a real one over here and an orange one over here. And if you went over there, that was trouble. Oh, wow. Some of those little small things, when we go in and get guys who've been shot up like this, and the corpsman or the guys on the ground, pop a smoke. And they would pull that canister, and I'd say green smoke. Or else he'd say no. And then i look over, okay, yellow. It's yellow. That's where we would go. Because if you went to the wrong place, you know, that, that, that got ugly in a hurry. I want to invite Jasmine to come up and ask her question because it's going to take us to talking about the variety of things you did while you were there just fighting on a daily basis. So, Jasmine, go right ahead. What was it like in the Vietnam War? So let's take a typical day, so to speak, Tom, to start that process. Just describe to them. You're getting up in the morning, and it's a great breakfast in the tent, and... <laughs> what happens from that point on? <laughs> if they're not seeing your facial expression. must be talking about the Air Force. No, oh, that's right. <laughs> just um, kidding, just kidding. Give the students an idea. What was it like? Um, I didn't really get too much breakfast. Uh, <laughs> Should have. Uh, but 
12, 14 hour days was not unheard of. As a matter of fact, that's usually seven days a week. And um, it was uh, getting up, getting the aircraft ready, making sure everything was right. And uh, we would get in it and take off and hopefully bring that same aircraft back. If we didn't, we'd be brought back to get another one. We've got some video of, uh, of helicopters on reconnaissance flights. Talk a little bit about the importance of reconnaissance and what it's designed to do that would make a difference for future you know, success. Okay, as an example would be that um, artillery piece that you saw. Actually, you can see it very well, that artillery piece. Uh, but before that happened, it was totally covered over. Uh, we hovered in and I actually found six artillery pieces. And that was a pretty big find at that time. And um, it, it's very difficult to find things underneath there. And once you find them, actually know what you find. Because like Jack had mentioned, they put decoys out there. And you didn't always know. And um, he, he had mentioned something about uh, dropping a smoke, I mean, a, a napalm down. I remember seeing a big silver thing that was painted, had a bunch of black stuff on it. Just one spot kind of sparkled at me. And I, I said, I'm going to. I'm going to pop a few rounds off. And I said, OK. And I said, get a little closer, get a little closer, because I couldn't see it. And I went like this, and I didn't realize what it was, but it was a 10,000-gallon tanker mm. <laughs> in the Eshaw Valley. And that sent up a little bit of a fireball. And can you imagine a 10,000-gallon tanker on the highway, somebody hovering 100, 200 feet above it, and you fire an M60 that's got um, a um, tracer round. Uh, every fifth round is a tracer round, so when it hit that fuel, it just exploded and just engulfed us and see what happened. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest, is, I just the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> right. um, we've got some video of um, the Cobra helicopters in battle that we can show as we talk about this a little bit. And you flew Cobras, correct, yes, Jack? Yes, so talk about the nature of what it was like to fly them, their maneuverability, what they were designed to do. Well, uh, the Cobra helicopter was introduced in Vietnam by the United States Army, and the Army gave six helicopters, six Cobras to start with to the Marine Corps. I was the fifth trained Cobra pilot in the Marine Corps. What we learned real quick, as you can see, it has a slender fuselage where we sat, whereas the other one had, was built for four people sitting next to each other. It was totally designed, totally designed to be an assault helicopter, and you were always in the mix. You weren't transporting anything. It was always uh, shooting. And um, to get back to Jasmine's question, what was a day like? A day like as a Cobra helicopter pilot, we took it on in the morning. And we would get a, a reasonable breakfast. But it was like Tom was saying, it's all day. You, and you're, at some point in time, you run out of adrenaline but you just keep going. And that was one of the things that I found that m my mind would start to let me down long before my body. Oh, I'm tired. You're really tired, you got a half a day left. And you're shooting all day long and they're shooting at you and you just keep going and going and going. Now and what, go ahead. What big picture sense did you have of what you guys were doing that day, how it related to I don't know, an offensive or some bigger campaign plan. Did you guys have briefings that indicated, here's where we fit into this whole mix of things? Or was yes. it much more that kind of thing? Yes. Every, you know, we talked about a breakfast. Every morning, we had missions assigned. And, and you knew that day what your frequency was. And that was another thing. I talked about smoke. If Tom, Tom and I are flying or we're flying with you, I would never say what frequency to switch. Don't switch button one, two, three, four. You had a card and I had a card. And I would say, go button blue. And you would look at your card and button blue had a frequency next to it. Because if I said that freak, the enemy was going to pick it up. So that was your brief. And then there was never a time when I flew helicopters or even the fast movers up north that we weren't briefed on what they thought the enemy was going to do in the morning before we left what big offensive we were, where we were supposed to be, where we were supposed to be fire. Now, that sounds really easy. Here's your homework assignment. Okay, fine. You're in English class. And for all of you out there, you're in English class and the teacher says, we're going to have, you're going to write an in-class essay. You come back, you go in to take the test and they lay down a math quiz. And what's my analogy here? It never went 
or was like the brief. And I, I am convinced you will never replace the human mind on the battlefield to defend this country. That's where you all come in. We're going to run some video, Tom, of um, assault techniques where the Department of Defense narrator is describing what they're explaining to the American public is happening. And I'd like to do a little comparison between description, how accurate it is, versus what you guys were doing in the field. So let's listen to it first, and then we'll talk about it from your first person perspective. Assault techniques with helicopters are different from those used by fixed wing aircraft. Firing is normally broken off about 500 yards from the enemy so that the helicopter does not have to overfly the target. This reduces the vulnerability of the helicopter to ground fire. Breaking off at 1,500 feet, you don't get the enemy at 1,500 feet. I mean, those gunships that the uh, that Jack was talking about, the Marine Corps man, they came in, and I'm sure he hit the top of the treetops pulling out after gun runs. Oh, yeah. Um, if you didn't get right down there and mix it up, our guys on the ground were going to get hurt, and they were counting on you Right. get down there. And the other thing we found out, contrary to those tactics, if you... You tried to come in either in either a fast mover or alone at 50 feet or below or 1,500 feet and above because small arms fire, that's where you got into trouble. Uh, if they heard you coming and you're at 1,000 feet, they would just wait and listen for the sound and just shoot up and let you fly into it. But if you're 50 feet, one, they couldn't hear you a whole lot, or if they heard you, it was too late. And if you're 1,500 feet, most small arms wouldn't quite reach you that quick. That you'd be past it before it went through. So 500 feet, 500 meters, that was roll-in altitude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Never had that. Well, yeah. you know, difference between what the training video is showing, what they might want the public to know, and what you guys obviously had to deal with in, in reality. To give the students an idea about the reality of landing under fire, we've got an excerpt of a, of a group of Army man, probably a platoon, landing under fire so you can see what that's like. Two left guard six, I'm down on corral. I've got contact with some snipers, over. Everybody get off the middle of this LZ. Everybody move out, get out there. Four six, get that daughter set up on the hill. I want fire in one minute. Get a movie, back up. Second but two, three o'clock, you're on the other hill. Camino, I want artillery on that hill, and I want it now. Hurry up. Get over there, come on. Okay, that's it. They're bugging out now. So the white tracers were enemy fire? Yeah, the ones seeing? I saw was always white. I never saw any red ones coming out and, of And when people actually landed... Unless it was the Arvins. Could you hear? I mean, we hear that man fairly well saying, you know, go here, go there, that kind of thing. Was that kind of communication happening in the sense that you were actually able to hear someone on the field give you a command? Or was it stuff that they had already known in advance, land, and you're going to go 50 yards left or whatever the He's case may the be? Ground. Go ahead, Tom. Well, he's on the ground yelling, yeah. If you're on the ground, there's not a lot of noise except fire, you know, people firing. But um, in the air, you've got communication in your helmet. 
So you're, you're, you're in, in Camo. You can ask Jack about that. Now, we talked to the guys with the radio on the ground, but when you got down there right next to where they were, they were having trouble, you could hear them. I can hear. I can. I can still remember guys on the ground. Hey, can you wait? We got a. We got a guy with a sucking chest wound. Those were always first, because if you didn't get them to the hospital, they were going to die. And uh, then they'd say, "Can you take one more?" And uh, I don't think we ever said no. Yeah, you always do. <laughs> we are, you always never take said one no, more. but we sure come out of there heavy, many times, uh, limping along. And uh, yeah, you can hear it, and it's. It's chaos. It's chaos. People screaming, people hurting, people shooting, people, and that hasn't changed from the war in World War II to Korea to now, and I went back on active duty for the first Gulf War. It, it doesn't change. That's right. And when you hear that, your pride to help your fellow warrior takes over, and you're going to be there. You're going to be there. Um, and make no mistake about it, when somebody on the, when it was on the ground and they'd say, um, he's got a leg shot off, can you take him? We'll wait. We'll wait. But sure would appreciate if you'd hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> could you carry that? Could yeah. you carry that stretch a little faster? Could jogging and not stop you know, it? <laughs> could you run just a little faster? Yeah, they, uh, I never had to say that. Those guys were really picking them up and putting them down. I figured they'd that, be moving as quick as they, they possibly could. They wanted to get back too. out of there fast, too. Tom, you were kind enough to send us uh, some images, and one of them is uh, an image of your helicopter after crashing. So we can bring up this, this picture of your, of your helicopter crash. Give the students a sense of the sensation of that kind of experience, because for you it happened on multiple occasions. Are you a, an aware of going down oh, and what's happening to you and that kind of thing, <laughs> and, and surviving that experience? That was that was a <laughs> that was a bad one right there. Um, actually, it, it, it's organized chaos. It's chaos, but it's organized. And um, when you get shot down, and it depends how you get shot down, really. Uh, if, are you falling through trees? Are you just crashing into the ground or whatever? But it happens so fast and it's so surreal, but it's all slow motion. I know that sounds crazy, but um, if somebody's watching it all happen, they see you hit the trees and tumble and, and you're crashing down. But if you're the one in the aircraft, it's like you're on twilight zone. And um, you experience that later in life. You actually relive those experiences like that. I know that sounds crazy too, but I can be driving down the highway, and I swear to God, um, I can almost smell and feel the air and the, the drop out from underneath you. Like, he was in fast movers in a jet. I can't even imagine in a fixed wing aircraft what it would be like. Like Jack was shot down, I mean, that's, I just can't even imagine. Um, helicopters are one thing, but you know, fixed wings another. Uh, there's no ejection seats in a, a, a chopper, but oh. still. <laughs> did you have an ejection seat, Jack? I, I did when I uh, flew the fast movers. Yeah. Okay. And um, you had an ejection seat. Um, and when I was marking targets up in North Vietnam, I, I got shot up pretty bad a couple times. But um, unlike in South Vietnam, where you had a good chance of being rescued. Up north, uh, you did not, uh, and the odds are you were going to get caught. And that, you know, if there was anything I was going to do when I, if I had a crippled jet, was either get south of the DMZ, the demilitarized zone as we called it, or get what we called feet wet out over the ocean and eject. And um, because to come down in North Vietnam, and you've seen the stories, you've heard the stories about how they treated them. And I've read those things, and it's worse than they wrote. Let's talk a little bit about flying planes, because you got the chance to do that, obviously, as well as the helicopter. And one of them was the A-4 Skyhawk. We've got, right. we've got video of the A-4 Skyhawk in combat. Give the students a little bit of what it was like to fly this plane. What was it designed to do? What did you like about it? Uh, the airplane was what well, it was nicknamed. It was the A-4 Skyhawk, and we nicknamed it the Scooter. Small, tiny uh, cockpit, very small. If you were six three or four, you weren't uh, going. That's it right there. You were not going to get in that cockpit. Everything was close, and and it was very maneuverable. 
Um, and um, we use it, I use it to uh, mark targets. And uh, you would roll in with a rocket that we had, was 10 feet long and about three inches around. And when you shot that rocket down at that target, then the bombers, the Air Force bombers coming out of uh, Udorn or the Navy ships, Navy aircraft coming off the ships, they would see that target. And how did we do it? How do you, how do you set that up? How do you mark a target? If you've, you have a target you're shooting at and you have a sight in your airplane. And I would roll in generally from about 15, 16,000 feet. And that was that the limit of 23 or 57 millimeter, which just looks like great clouds. First time I ever saw it, I, it was a beautiful day. All of a sudden these little great clouds start popping up and I go, what kind of meteor meteorological is this? And I thought, they're shooting at me. That's what it is. You roll in 60 degree dive at about 450 to 500 knots. And that, if you want to know what miles per hour is, a knot is 1.1 miles per hour. So that would be about, if you're going 500 knots, that's 550 miles an hour if I did the math right. Mm -hmm. So in you go. You put your sight right on that target. You don't count for anything else and you shoot it and when you pull off you tell the bombers that was Pipper meaning my sight to bull the bullseye the target if the if it went left they knew where the wind was from if it went right or north or south and they would adjust accordingly and when they rolled in most of them were dropping 12 500 pound bombs and I can tell you a 500 pound bomb would make this room the size of coffee cups. You wouldn't know anything. Then, uh, and each, there would be four airplanes with six or 12 of those and they'd roll on the target and when he pulled off there was no target. Wow. So it was amazing, uh, that's, that's the way it worked. Now that's a different, you also flew a Bronco, which looks quite different. Right. That and we can show some south. audio of that as well. What was, yeah. the, what, what was the, the Bronco designed to do? The Bronco was an OB-10 Bronco, and uh, it was a twin-engine turboprop airplane, which we flew down south to mark targets with. It was a little slower mover, and as you can see, that's it right there. And um, you could stay on station a long time, and as the ground guys called, hey, we got enemy in the open. There's a tank. There's a gun. We would roll in, and I'd have airplanes, other airplanes, the fast movers, jets with bombs and napalms. And I'd mark the target, and I'd say, okay, Air Force F-4s, roll in on that target. Okay, i mark another target. I will tell you, uh, I controlled naval gunfire while I was over there with one of those airplanes. And I, if you had to take a guess, what ship, what battleship do you think was firing the rounds. The rounds were as big as Volkswagen cars. 16 inches. Tell me what, name a battleship, USS New Jersey? Well, I'm gonna give you the clue. We're in the state. Missouri. Right. The Missouri. USS Missouri. 16 inch. It, it was huge. And we had an island that there was a lot of, it was in the middle of the river, we couldn't get to it. Maybe about half the size of this school, maybe not quite. But we couldn't get to it. They had the rivers around, they had tunnels. So the USS Missouri, I never saw the ship, never saw it. And um, so they would fire a little bitty marking round and I'd say a little long, a little short, a little left. And we got those guns. And then they, the guy at the ship said, I want you a mile to the north. Move one mile to the north. And when you're a mile, you call ready, fire for effect. And I moved a mile to the north in that little airplane you just saw after I'd been controlling it, and I hollered, fire for effect. And the whole earth shook as round after round after round pounded that island. And after about 10 minutes, when the smoke cleared, there was no island. It was just a river. It was gone. You, you could hear those rounds go through the air. We called them in and we didn't know we were going to get naval fire coming in and we certainly didn't know it was 16 inch guns and we sure never would have called them in. And we were begging for fire support and we were shot down on the ground and all of a sudden we heard 
perfectly silent. And then, like he said, like Jack said, the whole earth changed. I mean, we came, this, we were on the other side of this big mountain and it hit on this side of the mountain. We're on this side. It lifted us up, my, myself and the pilot I was flying with. We both went up in the air, fell down, rolled down the hill. I mean, you wouldn't believe the concussion. I mean, and, and, and it had a mountain between us and it was just phenomenal. Those, can you imagine 16 inch, and what, how long are they? Oh, I don't know. Five foot, six but foot. But we did huge. the same thing with uh, B-52 and mm -hmm. we called it the arc light. That yeah, was three B-52 bombers. And they would go wingtip to wingtip and drop 100, 500 pound bombs. And we were having trouble up in a, in a place called Elephant Valley, northwest of Da Nang. Yep. And Da Nang was pretty much right in the middle of the country. And they were just bringing in stuff. And the reason they, they would run it in on elephants, that's why we call it Elephant Valley. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget, I controlled three or four B-52s they were in trail, one behind the other. And the first one dropped its 100 bombs, 500 pounders. And then the second one dropped, and the third one dropped, and the fourth one dropped. I'll bet we covered miles. And I looked down, and the, all those trees and underbrush you saw, you could have picked those up and picked your teeth with them because they were no bigger than toothpicks. Wow. And that ended. And the earth just shook, just shook. Thank you, gentlemen. Those really bring the experiences to life. I want to go to Zach, who's going to ask a question, and we'll begin to transition from the experiences in war to returning home from war. So he's going to give us a little bit of a summary at this point. Go for it, Zach. What was your favorite part about being in action? So in terms of thinking about on the positives of being in action, Tom, what comes to mind? What was your favorite part of being in action? God, truthfully, I mean, at the time, I hate to say it, but uh, con getting our confirms, it was the biggest push that the American government had at the time was telling us they wanted us to get as many confirms as they, we possibly could. And, and that's what we did. It was, the objective was to kill the enemy, and our particular job was to go out and hunt them down, and we did that every single day. Jack? Well, Zach, I think one of the most pleasurable things about it was when... I got, at the end of the day, I had helped a fellow warrior. I had, they had helped me, I had helped them, and I had built some friendships and camaraderie that I have to this day. Um, and you have no idea what that's like, because you're sitting here listening to two combat veterans tell stories. But how many of you, uh, Tom and I have a bond already. And if you know a veteran, this Veterans Day, I would submit to you, if you ask them a question, let them answer it. Don't say, I saw a movie, or I, I read this in a book. Hear them out. Because we went over as young men and women like you, and we came home different people, never to be the same, good or bad hear them out. And if you listen to that veteran tell his story, you will have a bond for the rest of your life. And that, Zach, is in my opinion, the most pleasurable thing you can have. That's true. I concur with that. What I said was wrong. <laughs> I'm sick though. <laughs> Let's do that transition from war to, to peace. Talk a little bit, Jack, and Tom, I'll ask you too. What was the transition like going home? It was tough. Uh, 13 months of combat every day. Uh, I saw my wife, and we've been married 49 years next month. Uh, five days out of that 13 months, we had a child. Uh, I never saw the second year of her life. I never saw her learn how to walk. I never, she started, she was talking when I got home. She didn't know me when I got home. Um, there were two very difficult experiences. The Vietnam War, I had no idea until I got home. We were not appreciated. That there were people over here who literally hated us, called us baby killers, spit on us. My personal example was I was coming home after 13 months. I was meeting my wife in Chicago. I was in my uniform. We landed at O'Hare. 
there was a gen I got off the jetway, there was a gentleman behind me dressed like Tom and I in a business suit. And he pushed me and said to me, get out of the way, you SOB. I should have ripped his lips off. Surgeons tell me it takes a long time to grow lips back. <laughs> but I thought, if I do this, I'm going to come off this jetway in handcuffs, and it's very hard to hug your wife or your loved one with handcuffs on. I've never forgotten that. Never forgotten that. The second situation where I was made fun of that really hurt, my brother was a, was a senior in high school. He was several years younger. He was playing basketball one night. And back then, I went to watch him. Been home about three weeks, maybe four. And when the game ended, instead of like in your gymnasium, your sports, they end with a horn. We're in this gymnasium. They ended it by firing a pistol that starts a track meet. And I wasn't watching. And when they fired that pistol, I literally dove under the bleachers. Everyone began to laugh and make fun, and they knew I was a Marine. I had a short haircut. My wife crawled off of that stage, took my hand, and we walked out of that stage with our heads up. Those were my two very ugly experiences since I've been home. And as a legacy, my job is to make sure when you come home, you're never treated that way. Tom, what was your experience like returning from war? I fortunately never encountered any um, negativity like that, but I was medevaced out every time. I never got to walk. The only time I walked out of Vietnam was two years ago <laughs> when I went back to visit. Um, but I was in the hospital, and I just, It was difficult because I was never able to assimilate back into uh, civilian life. I, I, I couldn't leave the military. I, was, I guess I was addicted to it, and um, I couldn't flip the switch back. It's a switch that gets flipped inside of you, I think, and it's somewhere in your, inside your brain. And um, no matter how bad you may be physically or mentally, you, you, get, you have that f switch flipped, and you, you just got to go back and do it again. And so um, I stayed working for our government, um, just like Jack. Jack became one of the best test pilots in the world at McDonnell Douglas. And we, we stay into that kind of work. I mean, it's just, if we're not doing it ourselves, we're training somebody to do it. So uh, it's just one of those things. Yeah, you both continue to stay in service in, in a variety of different capacities. And talk about that, Jack, a little bit, about the, the, the importance you think about in terms of serving your nation in that way, in a variety of different ways. And there are several ways to serve your country. You can put the uniform on, like Tom and I and so many others, perhaps relatives you all have had. But one of the, 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 the forgotten warrior are the relatives and family back home. If you have a chance, say thank you to them. Um, my wife would go babysit for a, a young mother who had two small ones and her husband was Afghanistan and I had served in that first war, first uh, Gulf War. So you can do that. You can, you can, there's a lot of things you can do to help become a warrior. Now, I, once I finished my military career, I had a sense of this country is the greatest country in the world. We've got our problems and that's not going to change and we'll struggle through that. So I decided to build the best aircraft and test the best aircraft that I could give you to go fly and defend this nation. That's my job. And then, um, I have something I want to say, and Tom can wrap it up, but it, it, it's heartfelt right here. What have you done to earn the right to be called an American? What have you done? The reality is you haven't done anything. It's been a gift. Someone gave you that right to be an American. Your parents, you were born into it. But when you receive a gift, if you look back, Someone paid a price to purchase that gift for you. Tom and I did that. And now here's what we expect of you. We expect 
you to earn the right to be an American so that someday you can give that gift to someone else, the right to be an American. You'll earn it. You'll keep our flag high. You will not let it drag through the mud. I can see it in your eyes, those of you that haven't gone to sleep. <laughs> well said, Colonel Jackson. Thanks very much. Well said. Tom, I'm going to add a little something else to the, the question with you, too, as well, because we got this question from folks watching us in Arizona, Four Peaks Elementary School, which is in Apache Junction, Arizona. And they're asking about commemorating Veterans Day. And what should people do for veterans? How would be good ways to think about commemorating Veterans Day from your perspective? So as you think about summing up things for the students here in terms of the importance of service and the variety of ways to give it and to honor those who have served our country in any number of ways, what would you think about all that? What would you say? Especially today, the young men and women are given a lot of themselves that are in the military today. It's a different military today than it was when we were in. And I think one of the greatest things that uh, a, a young man, a young woman, or even a senior man or woman that served their country can experience is to have somebody come up, say a few simple words of, thank you for your service. You'd be surprised what that means. And I never, you know, I, I, w I had heard people had said that. I had never had it said to me or anything. But I remember the first time that it happened to me, and uh, it really meant a lot. And just saying that, thank you for your service, appreciate it. And, and that's all you have to say. Uh, that's all anybody has to say. It, it, it beats the opposite. There's still. I would add to that. If you see a Vietnam veteran, and some of them wear their hats, most of us don't, thank you for your service, but if it's a Vietnam veteran, we never got this, walk up and say, welcome home. home. Done. Tom, thank you. It, it's been a rare and, and, and really wonderful opportunity to be able to talk to both of you. I really appreciate you taking the time to share your, your history, your stories, your expertise, and your service. We thank you for your service, and thank you very much for your time today. I can't thank you enough. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Um, it's, it's an honor. It's an honor for that. Um, I want to thank Marquette High School the Air Force Junior ROTC program here, everybody in the Rockwood School District who has made this program possible today. Our thanks to the librarian who let us come in and take her conference room and rearrange it quite a bit to make this all happen. And of course, to you, our viewers, it's been a pleasure being with you. Thank you for joining us. Goodbye, everybody.